Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Yes, it's the Skeptic Zone podcast, episode number 707. 707. I haven't been on a 707 for a long time. For the 24th of April 2022, Richard Saunders coming to you from a sunny Sydney, Australia. What's on the show this week? What's on the show this week? Homeopathy on trial. We follow up from a story we carried, oh, some time ago, about the Centre for Inquiry taking legal action against the Walmart and CVS pharmacy uh, companies for selling what we considered to be quackery, useless products, homeopathy, in their stores. We're going to see what the latest on that story is, including a report on a court trial, which is going on at the moment, and also new news new news about action taken by the Centre for Inquiry against the Boiron homeopathic company itself. Now, of course, for a long time, we've known that homeopathic um, products are practically useless. They don't actually do anything because they can't do anything. Not in this universe anyway. So I think you'll find this story to kick off the show enlightening. Following that, it's the Australian Skeptics Newsletter, wonderfully read once again by Adrian Hill in Canada. Let's see what's caught the attention of the Australian Skeptics in the last week. After that, it's part two of the Book of Tim of Out of Body, Out of Mind, where we look at uh, body dysphoria, phantom limbs, and so on. Of course, this is a reading from the Skeptic magazine. Then to round off the show, Trove, the Trove Archives, we look for references in the Australian uh, digitized history to naturopaths, naturopaths, which sort of ties in a little bit to the very first story of uh, homeopathy, I think. Now, if you hear this episode in time, I'm trying to put it out as soon as I can, because at 11 a.m. today, 11 a.m. today, Eastern Australian time, Sydney time, Brisbane, Melbourne time, Hobart, I think. Uh, We have an online talk by none other than Susan Gerbeck, and she'll be talking for the Gold Coast Skeptics up in Queensland. If you hear this uh, in time, if you're an early downloader, and I get this out in time, (laughs) check your local time zones, but if it's before 11 a.m. here on the east coast of Australia, uh, click the link in the show notes, and you can watch a free talk by Susan Gerbeck all about... Operation Onion Ring. And this is about exposing medium Thomas John. Now, just before I go running down the stairs to look for something to uh, to munch on, if you're planning a long trip today, I hope the Skeptic Zone can keep you company in the car. I know a lot of people, a lot of people listen to the Skeptic Zone while driving along through traffic. If you're one of those people today, thank you for listening, and I hope... The Skeptic Zone makes your driving, your trip, more enjoyable. But now it is time for me to run downstairs, grab that cup of coffee. I wonder if there's a donut. I will ask Henrietta the Cat and Maud, who are at the door. Hang on. Henny, do you have any donuts? Uh, She doesn't want to answer that. Well, I do that. I hope you enjoy The Skeptic Zone. Centre for Inquiry and Homeopathy. In 2020, and even back in 2019, I ran some stories regarding homeopathy. In 2019, it was an interview with Nick Little from the Centre for Inquiry, and that was on episode number 553. Now, I was chatting to Nick about the legal action undertaken by the Centre for Inquiry against Walmart and CVS pharmacies for selling homeopathy. 
and I'm happy to bring you an update to that story. And I'll quote from a page over at the Center for Inquiry, which I'll link to in this uh, in this week's show notes. CFI, Center for Inquiry, meets Walmart and CVS in D.C. court over homeopathy lawsuit. And this was published on January the 27th. On January 13, the Center for Inquiry reached a major milestone in its groundbreaking consumer protection lawsuits against retail giants Walmart and CVS. Uh, for those of you in Australia and other parts of the world, CVS is a massive chain of pharmacies. In fact, when I'm in the United States, I often find myself in a CVS pharmacy for one reason or another, and I have noticed the homeopathy they sell. CFI is suing these mammoth corporations over their deceptive sale and marketing of homeopathic products under the consumer protection laws of the District of Columbia. And on the 13th of January, CFI legal director Nick Little presented oral arguments on four cases before the D.C. Court of Appeals. And Nick Little says both Walmart and CVS spent much of their briefing accusing the Center for Inquiry of being obsessed with homeopathy. And then he says, and they aren't totally wrong in that accusation of obsession. We are very, very determined to ensure that this multi-billion dollar a year fraud on consumers is stopped. We will explore every avenue to protect them. The article goes on to say that Walmart and CVS, meanwhile, are very, very determined to prove that CFI has no standing, claiming that we... CFI don't actually count as a consumer protection organization. But that's an argument that falls apart under even the slightest scrutiny. And it goes on to say what CFI does is consumer protection, whether it is challenging psychics to stop acting as grief vampires, pressing state governments to properly regulate charlatans like acupuncturists and naturopaths, or using the D.C. courts to stop mega-retailers misrepresenting homeopathy to their customers. And that was another quote from Nick Little. Opposition to pseudoscience isn't a philosophical position alone. It has a purpose, fighting quackeries about consumer protection. And that's what we told the court. Now, what is interesting and I found this fascinating, is that uh, the court proceedings were on Zoom and were recorded and are on YouTube. I will link to this page in this week's show notes. You can read that roundup for yourself, and then you can click the link. Since the arguments took place over Zoom, you can see it all unfold for yourself. That's what the page says, and indeed I did that. I clicked the link, and I was brought into or over to the um, the official court video, I imagine, and I watched with fascination the arguments, the legal arguments put forward by Nick Little and then the representatives for Walmart and CVS. Now, what I found was fascinating was the defendants, the attorneys for Walmart and CVS, were putting up these interesting arguments that really weren't, in my humble opinion, my non-legal opinion, they really weren't applicable trying to suggest that the Center for Inquiry didn't like the fact that maybe two products were, were next to each other. They talked about butter and margarine or milk and almond milk. But right at the end of the, the session, Nicholas Little countered with, I'm paraphrasing here, that's not really the question. And he made the point that uh, what the argument is, is that homeopathy is not in fact medicine or does not in fact work. You might want to view that uh, proceeding for yourself. It's most interesting. But this brings us now to more action taken by the Center for Inquiry. And in February 2020, in the before times, just before the pandemic hit, I, on Skeptic Zone number 591, I looked at a book, uh, a free booklet, I think I got from a CVS pharmacy or another pharmacy from the Boyron Company. Boyron are a huge manufacturer of homeopathic products for the United States market. I, I guess they'd probably sell them elsewhere too. And in that episode, I looked at the claims and information in the booklet, which borders on farcical. No, it doesn't border on farcical. It, it travels into farcical country, lock, stock and barrel. Which brings me to the next part of this story concerning the Boyron Company and the Center for Inquiry. 
Which brings me to a report on a website I was not familiar with before called Techie Live. I think it's pronounced Techie Live. I'm not really sure. Tech I Live. Anyway, T E C H I L I V E dot I N if you're interested. And briefly, the story says Scientific Integrity Watchdog slaps lawsuit on maker of homeopathic pills. A non profit scientific advocacy group sued Boy Ron last week for deceptively marketing its homeopathic products legal documents show. The Center for Inquiry, CFI, filed the lawsuit against Boyron, a Pennsylvania-based manufacturer that sells homeopathic treatments, claiming that the company deceives customers about the nature and effectiveness of its products. The complaint alleges that Boyron sells a plethora of identical treatments that consist of sugar pills and powders, all while claiming that each of the products treat a specific illness or ailment. Now, I thought it would be interesting to look at this legal document, which is online. The PDF is over at the Center for Inquiry. And it says, Superior Court of the District of Columbia, Civil Division, Center for Inquiry, Inc., Plaintiff versus Boyron, Inc., Defendant. Complaint for violations of the Consumer Protection Procedures Act. On behalf of itself, consumers and the general public of the District of Columbia Plaintiff, Center for Inquiry, brings this action against defendant, Boyron, Inc., for the unfair and deceptive trade practices it regularly utilizes in the marketing and sale of homeopathic products. Now I'll just mention some of the points that they point out. Defendant repeatedly violated and continues to operate in violation of the Consumer Protection Procedures Act, CPPA, through a carefully crafted scheme of misrepresentation, obfuscation, ambiguity, innuendos, and falsities, Boyron offloads otherwise worthless products upon the unwitting, the ill-informed, and the vulnerable. Upon the investigation of counsel, information, and belief, plaintiff alleges the following in support of its claim. Let's look at some of these. 1. Homeopathy is pseudoscience, quackery, faux medicine, health, fraud. 2. Boyron is the self-described world leader in, quote, homeopathic medicines, end quote. 3. Defendant's entire business is based upon fiction, a centuries-old confidence scheme long past its shelf life. Homeopathy does not heal. Homeopathy does not cure. Homeopathy is wishful thinking deceptively packaged and sold for a hefty profit, nothing more. And this next point is quite interesting. Equipped with an inventory in excess of 1,000 various items, including toxic plants, animal venom, noxious gases, controlled substances, heavy metals, radioactive materials, bacteria, parasites, virus particles, excretions, and even the urethral secretions of persons infected by a sexually transmitted disease, proponents of homeopathy peddle, quote, drugs, end quote, they claim will treat all medical conditions. Point five, defendant recommends and sells a variety of products, each of which it claims will uniquely and specifically treat a plethora of conditions. Yet each product is materially identical in their contents and effects, each indistinguishable but for the promises Boyron makes to consumers. And just looking through some of the other points here, point eight, to consumers, defendant deceptively holds out its products as medicine. Another point here may be, when we look through some of the points, point ten, Defendant utilizes carefully crafted marketing materials and packaging to convince consumers that Boyron products will treat injuries, reduce muscle stiffness, disappear bruises, assuage poor concentration and irritability due to overwork, and even heal surgical wounds. It convinces consumers to buy its goods at a premium with no intent to deliver the items as promised. 
6.11 through its statements, acts, and omissions, through innuendo and ambiguity, defendant dupes consumers. And that legal document is about five or six or seven or eight pages long. And just scrolling through it now, it's quite interesting because the uh, document goes on to show evidence to back up their uh, claims here in the form of screenshots and package shots about the uh, the product's Boiron cell, including highlighting that uh, right on one of their packages here, they say homeopathic Arnica, pain reliever, and other claims under the banner of natural, safe, and effective. And another product here they're selling, and this is pointed out in the document, the claim is reduces duration and severity of flu symptoms. And there are more examples listed here. I'm going to link to this all these uh, pages I've mentioned in this week's show notes. And it's something that uh, I think the skeptical community worldwide will be paying close attention to. Because uh, what we've found here in Australia, I think, and other places in the world have discovered this, that if you really want to make changes then it's the slow path that normally does the trick of um, lengthy legal procedures, red tape, going through the correct channels and so forth. We look forward to the next developments in the cases of uh, the Centre for Inquiry versus Walmart and CVS and indeed the Centre for Inquiry versus the Boyron homeopathic company. Hi, I'm Ben Radford, co-host of Squaring the Strange podcast. In these trying times, as we help each other out to hold on to hope, we want you to know that we're here for you. Hey, 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 what are you going on about? Uh, who's interrupting my heartfelt promotional copy? It's me, Celestia Ward, your co-host. Really? In these trying times? That's the best you can do? Well, I'm just doing what everyone else is doing. I thought... That's not what we do. Oh, for crying out loud, who else is here? Pasqual Romero, your other co-host? Hey. We don't do what everybody else does, Ben. That's kind of our thing at Squaring the Strange. Yeah, we try to approach things a little differently than your standard skeptical talky talk show. We do our own thing, bringing science, critical thinking, and skepticism to bear on issues of the day. We've got a professional skeptical author, Ben, who has decades of experience researching topics for a dozen books and thousands of articles. And a cartoonist skeptic, Celestia, who knows her stuff when it comes to facial weirdness and the psychology of perception. And a badass heavy metal rock star and tech engineer, Pasquale, who brings knowledge of all things audio, plus a bunch of neck tattoos. Squaring the Strange explores topics both mysterious and mundane through a critical lens. Monsters, panics, media literacy. Okay, forget the whole trying times promo idea. But we have chupacabras and clown panics, right? Yes, yes Ben. ben. Everyone, it's Adrian Hill from Canada here to read the highlights from the Australian Skeptics Newsletter. This is newsletter number 146. You can subscribe to this newsletter and get it delivered to your inbox every other week, complete with links to all the stories. Just visit www.skeptics.com.au. But now, let's get to the newsletter and see what Tim Mendham has lined up for us. Hi all, says Tim. It's not surprising that the conspiracists were out in droves during the recent floods in Queensland and New South Wales. The ones we've heard from the usual, quote, well-informed do-your-own-research and, quote, family members, concern cloud seeding designed to literally drown out dissenting voices among the alternative lifestylers in the northern coast of New South Wales, and move people into cities where they could be more closely monitored. 
which is too bad for other less alternative areas, but apparently they were collateral damage. Read on, Tim. Conspiracy theories on floods. Flood victims from Australia's northeast coast, who in droves now self-identify as climate refugees, have converged on a grab bag of Facebook groups and community message boards to condemn some Byron Bay locals who have taken to calling recent flooding a man-made weather event that definitely isn't linked to climate change. Hmm. Not sure how that works. Homeopathy for COVID-19 randomized trial shows it does not work. Who would have thought? <laughs> Edzard Ernst reports on a recent trial on homeopathy. The authors of the report concluded that the results showed that Natrum muriaticum LM2 was safe to use for COVID-19, but there was no statistically significant difference in the primary endpoints of Natrum muriaticum LM2 and placebo for mild COVID-19 cases. The full paper, titled Homeopathy for COVID-19 in Primary Care, a Randomized Double-Blind Placebo-Controlled Trial COVID Simile Study, end quote, is available for free. Conspiracy Theories About the Bermuda Triangle Popular Mechanics does to Bermuda Triangle claims what it did to 9-11 conspiracies, takes them apart, looks at them closely, and throws most of them out the window with more hyperlinks per square inch than you can find on Wikipedia. How ghosts became a national obsession. A long and serious look at the UK phenomenon of increased interest in the paranormal, and specifically ghosts and UFOs with comment by skeptical researchers and paranormal investigators. One of the latter, quote, I think culture is reflecting back the horror of our society. The more extreme and horrific society is, and Lord knows with Trump, Brexit, coronavirus, and Ukraine, it has been about as extreme as it gets within most of our lifetimes. We seek ever more extreme forms of entertainment. I noticed from the audiences of my podcast, people are saying, we want to feel that hit of fear, end quote. How Ghosts Became Big Business the Daily Mail has a long and considered article, Will Wonders Never Cease, on professional ghost hunters. Some use what they say are scientific approaches, but they still want tour guides to show passion. One hunter commented on the commercial tours, quote, it's unscientific, profit motivated, and there's an incentive to make sure something happens so people come back. I'm not saying it's fake, but some give members of the public pieces of kit without training them how to use them properly. Just because something lights up or moves doesn't necessarily mean anything supernatural is going on." End quote. The March 2022 issue of The Skeptic is out, and it features a look at the ticks and tactics of high-level athletes to improve their performance a combination of superstition and pseudoscience that is nonetheless very influential on fans and would-be champions. The issue also features articles on what exactly is Agenda 21, what do-your-own-research entails, how a well-known critic of parapsychology had a change of heart, sort of, and much more. And if you haven't subscribed yet, now is the time to do so. Contact the editor if you're not sure if your existing subscription needs renewing. To subscribe to The Skeptic, go to our shop to sign up for a hard copy or digital edition, or both. The digital is offered free to those who take up the hard copy version. Just head for www.skeptic.com.au. Oh yay, statistics! It's the silliest statistic of the week! UFOs leave women pregnant. Oh, good grief. UFOs had sexual encounters with humans and even left one woman pregnant, witnesses have alleged. Or so the report goes, following the release of Pentagon documents obtained by The Sun UK from the Defense Intelligence Agency, or DIA, as part of a Freedom of Information request. But investigators at Snopes asked if the publicly available evidence proving these effects were the result of UFO encounters. 
It says that in the unclassified file listing, quote, UFO-related human physiological effects, unquote, the reported effects included not only burns, skin sores, and significant odors, but also sexual encounters. The report listed at least one encounter that allegedly resulted in an unaccounted for pregnancy. Trouble is, it's one pregnancy listed among many other supposed effects, but that nonetheless was the key item of media coverage. And the evidence for it? None. Just a claim made by someone who said they got pregnant thanks to aliens. We'll leave it to you to picture the scenario when the woman involved made her announcement. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, fly me to the moon in an alien spacecraft? Until next time, this is Adrian Hill signing off from Canada. Hey, this is Dr. Carl, Carl Krasinski, proud to be a skeptic, and you can find out more about me at drcarl.com and get lots of free stuff there as well. And now, a reading from the book of Tim with Tim Mendham. My name's Tim Mendham. I'm the Executive Officer of Australian Skeptics, Inc. and editor of our magazine, The Skeptic, which you can read and download most of the issues for free from our website, skeptics.com.au. Today I'm reading part two of an article by Marcello Costa called Out of Body, Out of Mind on the way the mind manipulates our view of ourselves. This was published in the March 2010 issue of The Skeptic magazine, which was volume 30, number one. You can download that whole issue off our website, as I mentioned. The part one covered uh, sort of strange phenomena that our our mind can influence us to believe that we have phantom limbs or no limbs or that we are dead or various other things. So it can be quite scary at times. But this one looks at um, our awareness of being in the world here and now. When everything works well and we feel that our body fits like a glove, we then feel part of a surrounding world. We feel that we are here and now. This feeling also involves an extraordinary integration of external sensory experiences combined together in the brain to give us the sense of being in a real world. But what happens if the brain makes up some sensory experiences? These are called hallucinations, and hallucinations can be defined as any perceptual experience in the absence of external stimuli and must be sufficiently compelling to be considered a true perception. There are many different conditions that can create hallucinations, including things like psychedelic drugs such as LSD. And like most such drugs, LSD abnormally activates the neurochemical processes in the brain involved in the building of a realistic experience. It stimulates the action of the endogenous transmitter, serotonin. Its powerful action not only produces rich visual hallucinations, but can also disrupt the very fabric of the experience of time and space. The ease with which our experience of reality can be disrupted by merely changing a tiny chemical in the brain suggests that the normal functioning of the brain nerve cells weaves the very experience of reality, usually in a way that is consistent with what is out there. Disruption of such processes is likely to result in abnormal experiences, such as happens in schizophrenia and other mental disorders are as a result of other psychotropic drugs. Lesions of some parts of the right parietal cortex caused by some neurological disorders lead to strange behaviour. Patients do not appear to be aware of any object in the external world on the left of their visual field despite not being blind. This spatial neglect, discovered by Italian neurologists a few decades ago, opened a new perspective in the understanding that it is the brain that constructs in a very crafty way our experience of what is out there. What happens if there is some cross-wiring between the different sensory components? The result is a 
mixing up of experiences with sound being felt like colours and perhaps vice versa, shapes and colours felt as sound. Synesthesia, the term used to describe this odd situation, is a relatively common condition, probably due to the excess growth of neural connections between different parts of the brain. Small changes in the expression of the genes involved in the normal wiring of the growing brain are probably responsible for this. Increased creativity and perceptive imagination may be the positive side of synesthesia. However, as the human brain evolved, there must be a delicate balance between experiencing just enough of what is there and enriching the experience too much. For survival, the brain must be able to establish quickly if what is out there is similar or different from what has been experienced before. This is an ongoing process of checking and comparing memory events against new experiences. The part of the brain involved in this delicate process is the hippocampus, seahorse-shaped part of the cortex. Researchers at MIT, University in America, genetically modified in mice some mechanism of communication between neurons involved in the process by which animals know where they are. The result was an impairment in distinguishing between two similar but not identical environments. This process may be the basis of the phenomenon of déjà vu from the French already seen or lived that is experienced by a majority of normal individuals in some moments of their lives. The sense of having seen something that has already been seen is a small shift in the ability to distinguish what is new and what is familiar. The feeling of some individuals that they can predict the future is probably a similar small step further and reveals the subtle ongoing processes that bind us to a safe here and now. The mysticism about reincarnation and past life experiences may reflect similar processes. The whole issue is that being in control. The most ingrained feeling of being a self is that of being in control of our own actions. Awareness of moving involves predicting the consequences in planning movements using ongoing sensory information. We are aware of the movements we intend to make rather than those we actually make. We are just ahead of time when we move, as the feedback is too slow to give us the appropriate awareness. Tampering with this brain process leads to feelings of either not being in control or delusions of control. The bizarre feeling that one's hand takes on a mind of its own is known as the alien hand syndrome. This occurs in cases where a person has had the two hemispheres of their brain surgically separated, a procedure sometimes used to relieve the symptoms of extreme cases of epilepsy. It also occurs in some cases after other brain surgery, strokes or infections. The inability to distinguish self and externally produced actions is reported by many psychiatric patients. These probably have disorders of those areas of the medial motor frontal region of the brain and parietal lobe where the integration of agency is built. An alien hand feeling can be elicited in normal people by hypnosis and by some clever laboratory manipulation of visual and touch stimuli. Accounts of alien abductions are more likely to represent the extreme examples of such an illusion. Hearing voices as coming from other beings is a common hallucination in schizophrenic patients and is probably due to misattribution of inner speech. In many ancient cultures, the experience of auditory verbal hallucinations or hearing voices was considered a message from the gods or other spiritual entities. A lot of popular and religious cultures have taken these phenomena as evidence of the separation of a soul from the body. More natural explanations on the basis of neural circuits of the brain and their interconnections are beginning to replace such supernatural explanations. The extraordinary experiences mentioned in this article, and as I have covered in these two presentations, represent a window into the hidden working of the brain. We, as individual persons, are made up in a continuous fashion by the interaction between our brain, body and environment, binding these different threads of experiences into one. The early interest of philosophers such as Sartre, Husserl, Heidegger, etc., in the field of subjectivity and self-awareness begins to become a legitimate subject of investigations by neuroscientists. It takes about half a second for neural activity to generate a conscious experience. During this time, millions of signals in parallel spread in the networks of neurons, 
bringing together all this into one unified state associated with the strong experience of being a unified, in-control self is one of the most dramatic events in biology and one that happens continuously in every human as a result of ongoing interaction with our organism, brain and body in a lifelong dance with the environment. However, given the ease of tampering with the self, this raises all sorts of questions, such as how can we be sure that we are capable of making free decisions? Are we automatons without free will? A decision on the answers to such issues could be pursued in future discussions. And that's Out of Body, Out of Mind, part two, from The Skeptic magazine, March 2010, or volume 30, number one, which you can download for free, and that whole issue of the magazine, and most other issues of The Skeptic as well, from our website, skeptics.com.au. Happy reading. Hello, this is Rob Palmer. You may have heard of me. Lately, I've been interviewing scientists, skeptics, and other critical thinkers from around the world for my column in the Skeptical Inquirer, and recently, some for the Skeptic Zone. My written interviews have included Jay Novella from the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, mass psychogenic illness expert Robert Bartholomew, Celestial Ward from Squaring the Strange, psychic busting private I, Bob Nygaard, skeptical activist Michael Marshall of the UK, and even secular activists Bailey Harris and Jean Delancey, that's Q from Star Trek. I even interviewed, believe it or not, a magic dragon, and another really well-known skeptic, Richard Saunders. You can find my online column with these interviews and more by Googling The Well-Known Skeptic plus Skeptical Inquirer. Also, follow me on Facebook at The Well-Known Skeptic. Cheers. Once again, to run back to those archives at Trove, trove trove.nla.gov.au, the online resource from the Australian government and the National Library of Australia, chock-a-block full to the brim, overflowing with uh, digitised scans, digitised scans, something like that, newspapers, articles, reports, periodicals, journals, and so on, going back decades and decades, even centuries. And this week, this week, in keeping with our general theme of looking at sceptical items, hardly a surprise on the sceptic zone, we're going to look at references in Australian newspaper history to naturopaths. Now, we often uh, say here at uh, the sceptics and other sceptical groups, I've noticed the initials N.D. after a naturopath stand for not a doctor and I think one of the broadest problems people have with the naturopaths is they have some sometimes they have some medical training and then that medical training goes wildly off the rails and dives into unproven therapies like iridology homeopathy reflexology and such like energy medicine things like this and before we go, a quick look over at uh, Natro Watch, which is part of Quack Watch. Many naturopathic theories and practices are not based on the body of basic knowledge related to health disease and health care, which have been widely accepted by the scientific community. Moreover, naturopathic education does not prepare practitioners to make adequate diagnoses and provide appropriate treatment. This website provides information about naturopathy that is difficult or impossible to find elsewhere. And one of the links there says, read this first, all right? It brings us to a page by uh, Stephen Barrett, MD, called A Close Look at Naturopathy. 
or naturopathy, depending on how you want to uh, pronounce it. Naturopathy, sometimes referred to as, quote, natural medicine, end quote, is a largely pseudoscientific approach said to, quote, assist nature and support the body's own innate capacity to achieve optimal health and facilitate the body's inherent healing mechanisms. Naturopaths assert that diseases are the body's effort to purify itself and that cures result from increasing the patient's vital force. They claim to stimulate the body's natural healing processes by ridding it of waste products and toxins. At first glance, this approach may appear sensible. However, a close look will show that naturopathy's philosophy is simplistic and that its practices are riddled with quackery. And as I said before, often things like uh, iridology and uh, homeopathy. And that is a lengthy item well worth your time to read, and I'll link to that in this week's show notes. And of course, you may recall the story of Brit Hermes, who studied as a naturopath until she discovered the glaring problems in the whole system, and then was sued for her remarks about naturopathy, and the skeptic some years ago came to her aid, and she eventually won her court case. But flicking back to Trove now, let's discover what we can find here. Let's find what we can discover. Let's discover what we can find. And here's a reference. Here's an item from the Times, Victor Harbour, South Australia. And I seem to remember we've quoted from this newspaper before. Uh, And this is dated the 20th of June, 1995, under the banner Healthy Life. Herbs, an alternative cure. Sometimes even the most outstanding doctors can't find a cure for your blues. You may have a recurring illness, feel generally sick, or be constantly tired. Undiagnosed illnesses can not only be frustrating, but can lead to depression and lack of confidence and low self-esteem. If treatments don't seem to be working, it may be time to try a different type of therapy. Naturopaths are becoming more and more accepted by the broader community. No longer are herbal concoctions thought of as witches' brews, even though there are still skeptics. A visit to the naturopath can seem a bit strange, even daunting. You will be faced with a barrage of questions about your general health, health history, way of life, and even family background but all the information is used to create a profile of you. Instead of the usual checkup routine, a naturopath looks into your eyes. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Looks into your eyes to get an idea about the body's state of health. This is called iridology. I swear I didn't didn't look this up before. I, I made my comments before, but there you go. This is called iridology and involves viewing the iris of the eye and gaining an understanding of the person's constitution. What can be read from the eyes can be quite amazing. The naturopath will be able to tell you things about your health which you haven't revealed. I bet by asking a lot of questions. It's quite strange to be told that you get thirsty a lot, or you don't get much exercise from having someone look in your eyes. But it does give clients a faith in their naturopath's knowledge and the prescribed treatment. In many cases, the naturopath will mix up a course of herbal medicine concocted from a number of herbal solutions which are combined and bottled. Each person has their medicine made just to suit them. It may seem that treatment isn't working for the first few days or even weeks, But it is important to persevere. A lifelong ailment could take months to be reversed or even subdued. Eventually, the entire mind, body, and spirit should feel the benefits of natural medicine. And the accompanying photograph of a a, a woman holding up a bottle, it, it appears to be, 
Port Elliot naturopath Anna McVoy can tell you plenty about your state of health by looking into your eyes. And now we turn to the Telegraph, which was published in Brisbane, Queensland, in 1946 on the 14th of May. Naturopath charged with fraud. Allegations that John Charles McGregor, 54, naturopath, had falsely pretended to a woman that he could diagnose certain ills by means of an optical instrument inspection and that he had the ability to cure her with tablets were made in the criminal court today. McGregor pleaded not guilty to a charge of false pretenses. The indictment alleged that McGregor, on or about August 1st, had obtained seven and six for a bottle of tablets from Helen Swindles. <laughs> and I'm not making that name up. Swindles? <clears throat> Helen Swindles, with intent thereby to defraud, and he pretended to her that he could diagnose certain ills from which she was then suffering. And he had so diagnosed a bad liver and a tumour behind her right eye, and that he had the ability to cure the ills with tablets. The Crown Prosecutor, Mr. C. J. Cosgrove, said evidence would be given that MacGregor had told Mrs. Swindles that her blood pressure was 190, and if it had reached 235, she would suffer a stroke and die, and that unless he dissolved the tumour behind her right eye, she would go blind. He had told her that her liver was in a bad condition, said counsel. The hearing is before Mr. Justice Breenan and a jury. Mr. Rex King, instructed by Messrs. Richardson, Carter & Co., appeared for McGregor. Part heard. That's interesting. I wonder if we can follow this story up. And indeed, I have discovered what happened here in the same newspaper, The Telegraph, dated the 15th of May, 1946. Naturopath not guilty of false pretenses. John Charles McGregor, 54, naturopath, was discharged in the criminal court today after a jury found him not guilty of a charge of false pretenses. The jury retired for only six minutes. Hmm. Summing up for the jury, his honour said, it was a most extraordinary and unfortunate case, which had lasted four days at the first hearing and two days at the second, in addition, to involving considerable expense over a man who had practised homeopathy over a number of years. There was a medical act which covered offences of persons who practised medical treatment without possessing the necessary qualifications, and if it did not go far enough, an amendment would be introduced by legislation, said His Honour. It did not seem right to use the criminal code against one man while so many others were doing practically the same thing, he said. McGregor had pleaded not guilty. It was alleged in the indictment that McGregor, on or about August 1st, had obtained seven and six for a bottle of tablets from Helen Swindles with intent thereby to defraud, and he pretended to her that he could diagnose certain ills from which she was then suffering by means of an optical instrument inspection that he had so diagnosed a bad liver and a tumour behind her right eye, and he had the ability to cure the ills with tablets. The hearing was before Mr. Justice Breenan and a jury. So there you go. He, uh, he got off. Now let's turn to the Brisbane Courier-Mail from 1951 on the 6th of April. Ten pound fine. Called himself, quote, doctor, end quote. A naturopathic practitioner who has been practising in New South Wales and Queensland for 17 years denied in the summons court yesterday that he was a charlatan or a quack. He is Maurice Charles Hewlett Blackmore of Empire Chambers, Wharf Street. He claimed his qualifications were backed by certificates from overseas institutions. Blackmore was fined £10 with 
three pounds nine costs for having contravened the medical acts by using the term of doctor. Mr. F. Connolly, for the medical board, said Blackmore exhibited five certificates bearing the word doctor in his waiting room. Studied abroad. Mr. R. H. Matthews said on Blackmore's behalf that Blackmore had three certificates which he got in England by study. He studied for four years in America and then did a postgraduate course at the St. Antonio Hospital. The name Doctor was on his certificates, and he was guilty only of a technical offence Mr. Matthews contended. Now, Maurice Blackmore was the founder of the uh, huge pharmaceutical company here in Australia, Blackmore's, who more or less concentrate on things like um, supplements and vitamins and things like that. If I go to the Blackmore's page, Heritage and History, Blackmore's has been an industry leader in Australia for more than 80 years. Our company had its beginnings in the 1930s thanks to the vision and passion of one man, Maurice Blackmore, an English immigrant whose ideas about health were way ahead of their time. Maurice Blackmore, 1906 to 1977, belief in the health-giving properties of herbs and minerals led him to develop a whole system of health care based on naturopathic principles. His views on natural health, preventative medicine, and environment and recycling were nothing short of radical in the 1930s, and his work opened the doors for new ways of treating ills and maximizing health. Maurice Blackmore's son, Marcus, took on the reins of the business in 1975. And as I said before, they are a very large uh, company. And Maurice Blackmore pops up a few years later again. Let's see, 1953, from the pages of Truth newspaper, the 6th of September. And it says uh, Brisbane, so up in Queensland. I won't read the whole story. Uh, it's The headline is, He's Got Certificates Galore. Safe to pick pimples, says naturopath in interview. Truth learnt this week that two more of Brisbane's bloodless surgeons had worked with missing Dalby doctor Alexander Mayer and Valley naturopath Claude Beals. It's a little bit of a a convoluted story, but I'll, I'll try to pick out some highlights. Wet feet and cold hands. They are self styled naturopaths. Maurice C. H. Blackmore. N.D., D.O., D.C., M.B.A.N., London, and Alfred F. Kaufman, M.A., D.O., D.P.H., D.R.M., London, with Empire Chambers, Wharf Street, Brisbane. The story goes on about uh, their qualifications, and at one point says Blackmore admitted he had been convicted and fined for using the title doctor, as we read in the last story, It was a technical business, he declared. His certificates, four of them, had been hanging on the wall, referring to him as doctor, and so he was hauled to court. And a bit later on it says, uh, Blackmore, or his offsider, speaking of Blackmore, says Blackmore was a doctor of philosophy, France, master of arts, Cambridge, doctor of osteopathy, California, Doctor of Reform Medicine, London. Doctor of Naturopathy. Doctor of Osteopathy, Newcastle on Tyne. And Fellow of the London School of Psychology. And Blackmore says, uh, talking to the newspaper, you'll find a lot of well-educated persons among naturopaths and osteopaths. I'm a Harrow man myself. And later on in the story, uh, Blackmore told truth that more than 1,000 patients a month passed through his Brisbane and Gippy clinics and he had, quote, made enough to retire on, end quote. His wages bill in Brisbane alone was £150 a week for his 15 assistants. Next, Blackmore brought to light his pet enterprise, the Naturopathic Chronicle, which he said he published and edited and which had a circulation of 5,000. Blazing headlines leapt out of the four copies showed truth. They condemned immunization, pasteurization, surgery, and applauded Blackmore's peritone. And I've just looked up peritone, and 
The first search that's come up is a bottle of pills from Blackmore's. That's interesting. Let's see what it is. And the bottle says, supports healthy bowel regularity. Uh, and it has on the, the picture here of the jar, the little jar, an Ost L number. And I think we've discussed sometimes in the past that uh, here in Australia, medicines are registered or uh, listed. Uh, Ost R number means registered, means it's gone through uh, checks to make sure it actually works. And Ost L listed simply means it's uh, manufactured to certain standards. It doesn't actually or not necessarily have to live up to the claims it makes. And you'll find many things in supplement and vitamin stores are listed uh, Ost L and not registered. The other thing that is applauded is Renatone. Let's look that one up. And I have a definition. Renatone is an antibiotic that fights bacteria. Renatone is used to treat or prevent recurring bladder infections in adults and children. Okay. And the next one listed is Membratone. Let's see what that is. Membratone by Blackmores. And all I can find here that the name has been apparently trademarked, but I can't see any products at the moment that have that. But the name apparently has been trademarked by Blackmore sometime in the past. Hepatone. And a return on Hepatone is liver detox, liver refresh, liver and gallbladder, liver detox from various companies. So it's that sort of, uh, that sort of thing. The next one says Pep-Ups. Pep-Ups. And the next one says Fluvax, which is spelled F. L-U-V-A-C-S. So I'm not exactly sure what that is. I'm not exactly sure what that is because nothing comes up when I do a search specifically for that apart from flu vaccination. And indeed, a, a return on flu, the word itself actually does come up with one, which is, um, this website is for US animal healthcare professionals. <laughs> right, <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on there. And just picking through this story, again, I'm sorry, this part is a little bit disjointed, but uh, I'm picking out some of the more interesting bits. Truth asked Blackmore why the medical profession regarded naturopaths as quacks. And Blackmore is saying here, just jealousy. They don't like us because we're the only people with scientific knowledge to expose them. And then Blackmore says, you know what? Doctors shut their eyes to our successes. I've had such cases of Bright's disease here, given three days to live by a doctor. I've treated them and today they're out working. And then Truth Magazine says, we doubt if the medical profession would accept that. And Blackmore says, I challenge them to. Any doctor, or for that matter, the whole board can come into this clinic for a week and be instructed in our methods. I'll bet they don't remain unconvinced. So there you go. And again, I'm sorry, this story is a little bit disjointed, but there's a lot of waffling to do with other cases and things, but I just wanted to get to some of the, uh, the more interesting bits concerning naturopaths and their claims. So there we go, a little look back into the uh, archives there, picking through various uh, results concerning naturopaths, and in particular, Maurice Blackmore. Now, that latest one about Maurice Blackmore, I might pass that along. That clipping, I might pass that along to some of my friends, who I'm sure will find that very interesting. That even as far back as 1953, Blackmore and naturopaths were condemning immunization, pasteurization, surgery, but applauding uh, these various uh, supplements. And you too can applaud all sorts of interesting things if you look into the Trove archives at trove.nla.gov.au. It's very easy to use. You simply type in what you want to have a look for. Up comes the search results, and you can select whether you want to see the uh, results in newspapers and journals or in magazines or other references. And like me, you'll never know what you might find.
Thank you for listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. And thank you to Henrietta and Maud the Cat. Oh, she's back. Hello? Come on, you want to come in? Come on. Meow? You might be able to hear a very quiet meow there. Sometimes I think they really are the executive producers of this show. But thank you to the people who really do help the show, the Patreon and PayPal supporters at SkepticZone.tv. Without your contributions, these cats would starve. Quick, get the violins out now. I think that'd be all right. But the show wouldn't continue. So I do appreciate everyone who chips in weekly or monthly to the Skeptic Zone to keep the show going. Thank you very much. Now, if you do go to SkepticZone.tv, scroll to the top of the page, or look at the top of the page. If you go there, you probably are at the top of the page. And you'll see a link to TikTok. The Skeptic Zone is on TikTok. And my latest TikTok video, all about spoon bending, sort of went a little bit viral and had thousands of hits in a very short time. I don't know why. I've got lots of videos up there about uh, word salad, spirit boxes, detox, ancient aliens, psychic readings, astrology, homeopathy, cryptids, crop circles, reiki, chakras, acupuncture, divining, hot reading, cold reading, and birds out the window. There are birds out the window. Henrietta, Maud, where are you? Go and chase the birds away. Have a look at those TikTok videos. You might enjoy them. They're very short. It's under a series called Mystic Minute. So most of those videos are a minute or or not even quite a minute. And so for this week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to the Skeptic Zone podcast. Please visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for show notes, contacts, and to access the back catalogue of episodes going back to 2008. You can follow the Skeptic Zone podcast on Twitter at Skeptic Zone, visit our Facebook page, or leave a review on iTunes. You can also support the Skeptic Zone via Patreon or PayPal. The Skeptic Zone podcast is an independent production. The views and opinions expressed on the Skeptic Zone are not necessarily those of Australian skeptics or any other skeptical organisation. Thank you.